In the Second War, the Allies saw the raid on Pearl Harbor as an act of unprovoked aggression. From the Japanese Emperor downwards, the Japanese people, by their treacherous attack on America and on Britain, have marked a day that will live in infamy. They held one man more responsible than anyone else, Japan's Prime Minister, General Tojo. He was the great Asian dictator, ranked alongside Hitler and Mussolini in an evil Axis trinity who planned to take over the world. After Japan's surrender, the Allies were ready to settle the score. 28 wartime leaders were unceremoniously delivered to a special court in Tokyo. The most prominent of the criminals, of course, is Japan's war premier, Tojo. He ordered the treacherous attack on Pearl Harbor and is finally responsible for unspeakable atrocities perpetrated by men under his command. Hitler and Mussolini had died in the turmoil of the last days of the war. With the world crying for vengeance, Tojo was a rare prize, a captured specimen, the beast of Tokyo at bay. The Allies blamed him for starting the war. The Japanese blamed him for losing it. Tojo Hideki, how do you Fifty years later, Tojo is the central character in a new Japanese film that tries to turn the history upside down and claims Japan's war was not one of aggression but of defense. Pride shows him not as the perpetrator but as an innocent victim facing a show trial. Tojo Hideki. Sono zenbu ni taishimashite watashi wa muzai wo shichou itashimasu. The film follows a book by Tojo's granddaughter, and it's part of a determined effort supported by right-wingers to rehabilitate the militarist. When the family were photographed together in the autumn of 1941, Yukio Tojo was a child. The image of Tojo is that he was the ringleader who started the war, a very evil man who led Japan to its first defeat. And to the bereaved families of the war dead, he's the most hated person who took their men's lives. The gap between that image and what my parents said was big. They said he was really a kind-hearted man who made the ultimate sacrifice by dying for his country. After the war, it suited the Allies and the Japanese to suggest there was one specially evil figure, one arch-conspirator. But this ignored the way Tojo emerged from the thousands of young officers who went through the same training and shared the same beliefs and values. There was nothing exceptional about Hideki Tojo. Born in 1884, the son of a general, he spent seven years in military schools. The Spartan tough regime emphasized physical fitness and frugal living. Like every other cadet, Tojo was indoctrinated with the special spirit of the Japanese army, respect for the emperor and unquestioning obedience. The narrow education was designed to cultivate mental strength, a will that knows no defeat. Like most Japanese officers, he believed that people should abandon their individuality. He believed that this was his function as a soldier. Loyalty to the emperor and willingness to die for the emperor was his existence. That's how he saw his role in the army. Luckily, no one accused the young Tojo of excessive individuality or imagination, so his career advanced rapidly. He was obsessed with detail and routine, 
both in the army and at home. My grandfather was very fastidious. He did everything according to a plan. One example of his precision is this child-raising diary. It shows the growth of my father from when he was born to the age of eight when he entered primary school. The diary was kept by both my grandparents. It shows the minute record taken every three hours or so when the baby was ill. It records the baby's condition, temperature, sleep patterns and frequency of the bowel movements. Young officers had little knowledge of the world beyond Japan. But each year the army sent a few to study abroad. In 1920, Captain Tojo did well enough to be dispatched to Germany. He was impressed by the way the German people had stood up to hardships during the First War and admired Prussian military discipline. And he sent a stream of unwarlike messages back to his family at home. During his three years' stay in Germany, my grandfather sent my father almost 160 postcards. There are many kinds. Children, little boys, shadow pictures, Peter Rabbit. Eighty years have passed, but the colours are still vivid. Tojo returned to Tokyo and never left Asia again. In the 1920s, he viewed the world in the same way as almost every other army officer. They saw Japan as victimized by the Western powers and prevented from establishing the overseas empire a first-class industrial nation needed. They believed the answer lay in expansion into China and the resource-rich region of Manchuria between the Japan Sea and the Soviet Union. In 1931, officers based in China took things into their own hands and seized full control of Manchuria. Tojo, by now a general, was posted to Manchuria in 1935. He was increasingly convinced that Japan was living in a hostile world surrounded by enemies, China, the Soviet Union, possibly the United States. He spoke of the white peril and the red peril and the fear of communism, which might undermine his emperor, alarmed him most. In Manchuria in the 1930s, Tojo was in charge of the Kempeitai, the military police. And this was a position of considerable power within the Japanese army. He developed a reputation for going by the book, adhering to the rules. So from the point of view of the ruling elite, of his day in Japan, uh, he looked very reliable. The marching feet of a conqueror. Across the vast territory of China, the tread of Japanese legions heralds another of the great conquests of history, relentless, inexorable. The fighting widened into a full-scale war with China after 1937. As they assaulted Nanking and brought more of China under Japanese control, they were condemned by the rest of the world. For Tojo, the continued fighting brought rapid promotion. With a reputation as an able bureaucrat, he was known as the Razor. And in 1940, the army chose him to be war minister in Prime Minister Konoye's cabinet, charged with the further build-up of the army. To try to end their isolation, the Japanese signed a pact with Germany and Italy and hoped to share the Asian spoils when, as they expected, Britain was defeated in the European war. With super patriotic fervor, they celebrated what was found to be Japan's 2,600th anniversary. The generals and admirals reported directly to their commander-in-chief, the emperor, not the Prime Minister. By now, they completely dominated the civilian politicians. <laughs> 
but the fuel which propelled Japan's growing armed forces had to come from their potential enemies, the very countries most hostile to what they were doing in China. 90% of their oil was imported. Over half of it came from America. When the Japanese military carried on regardless and made another move south into Indochina, the United States and Britain finally got tough. In July 1941, they froze Japan's assets, cut off the oil and demanded she withdraw. The shock of the oil embargo threw the unwieldy political system into crisis. The army refused to pull back and pressed for war. The prime minister resigned. And his replacement had to be chosen by a shadowy group of elders who advised the emperor, the Jushin. With the country sliding towards war, they picked a candidate who had no political experience and hadn't sought the job. For the first time, Japan had a full general as prime minister. He knew that there wasn't much time left. A decision for war or peace had to be made, and it had to be made in time for Japan to launch hostilities in the Pacific at the optimum moment. Tojo did not become prime minister in order to lead Japan into war, even though that has been uh, said by some people. Tojo became prime minister to break the deadlock in the Japanese government. And the deadlock was whether or not there was still any chance to achieve what Japan wanted short of going to war. Peace in the Pacific hangs on a slender thread. Tokyo's special last chance envoy arrives in Washington to talk appeasement with President Roosevelt. But each side still expected the other to back down. And the Americans raised their terms still further, insisting Japan withdraw from the whole of China, including Manchuria, a demand that seemed unacceptable to almost all Japanese. The government and army agreed to a secret deadline, if there was no settlement by mid-November, they'd go to war to seize Southeast Asia's oil fields. In Tokyo, at the end of the month, Tojo addressed a rally. By the time he spoke, the plan to unleash war had already been launched. He'd failed to break the deadlock. He knew they were taking on a far stronger enemy. The best hope was that the Americans might settle after a year or so. Tojo likened it to leaping from a high temple veranda into the unknown. He was taking a dangerous gamble with his country. But he felt it was now or never. <laughs> 
妊娠激闘海軍空襲部隊向け指摘撮影になるハワイ空襲ニュースを送って帝国海軍に対する全国民の絶大なる感謝と感激を集めましたが本社はさらにここに同じ空襲部隊撮影による商法を第2報として国民の前に送ります黙々として昼夜を我が田の猛訓練を積んだ地の結晶は12月8日米英戦線によって爆発 Tojo had been given the job of Prime Minister only seven weeks before Pearl Harbor. The Navy had made the plans for the now or never strike months before. The news of war after the months of secret negotiations shocked the Japanese when they heard it. But in the first hundred days, as the army and navy made a series of brilliant thrusts south, they seemed invincible. They took Hong Kong, landed in the Philippines, Borneo and Malaya, and moved down to Singapore, heading for the oil fields of Sumatra. Back in Japan, Tojo shared in the glory. つまり昭和17年の初め頃なんてのは、especially at the time when Singapore surrendered、あの頃はもう日本はその頂点にあったわけでしょ。だからあの例えばこれ、あの超人行列でご存知、ランタンパレインね、あのビクトリー、これね、それから旗行列、スクールチルデンね、はもう旗行列でみんなあの軍隊の歌、勝ってくるぞと一緒に走くって言ってね、あの軍歌を歌いながらそれで。兵隊さん頑張って兵隊さん頑張ってってこう兵隊がさこの町でも歩いてたらもうおーそうそうそうまあそれはもう we were extremely joyful at the time of Singapore surrender. This was the high point of General Tojo's popularity. Tojo warned against the intoxication of victory. The newspapers presented him as a man of sincerity and iron, efficient as a silkworm, a concerned and kindly grandfather watching out for the nation on all fronts. While driving through Tokyo, he would sometimes suddenly stop the car and get out. He would go and look inside people's dustbins and notice, for instance, that people were still eating fish and had enough food. He was checking for himself that living conditions were all right. The propaganda bureau worked to get all Japanese behind the war effort. Factories were shifted to munitions production. And the Tojos themselves set an example of thrift at the Prime Minister's house. Mrs. Tojo was always ready with needle and thread. When we went to report to Mr. Tojo, or ask for authorizations at his house, we would take off our overcoats at the front door, and Mrs. Tojo would brush them for us. Sometimes, if she saw that a button was missing, she would sew one back on. The message for the rest of Asia was that this was a war of liberation in which the white man's yoke was being thrown off and replaced with a new Japanese dominated order in Asia. In Singapore, Tojo reviewed the Japanese backed Indian Nationalist Army. Under Subhas Chandra Bose, which they hoped would liberate India from the British. And he called collaborating Asian leaders, branded as puppets by the West, to a conference in Tokyo. And may I express the hope that with the cooperation of Burma, of Manchukuo, of Thailand, of China, and even of the peoples of Java, Borneo, and Sumatra, that united with Japan.
into a compact and solid organization, there can no longer be any power that can stop or deter the march of one billion Orientals. In this onward march, Tojo held more power than any prime minister before. He was home minister and war minister at the same time. But he knew many were jealous of him and deferred to the emperor at every opportunity. He said he himself was a mere pebble reflecting the emperor's light. I am serving at his majesty's august command, but as an individual, I am but one of his majesty's humble servants. It is this, said Tojo, that makes the prime minister of Japan entirely different from the European dictators. But Tojo was ruthless as well as obsequious. Though there were constitutional checks on what he could do, newspapers and radio were censored and emergency powers were increased. And he used the military police to sniff out the communists, the red peril he feared so much. There were no mass deportations or concentration camps, but around 4,000 were arrested for political offenses and so-called thought crimes after 1941. The number was enough to instill fear and torture was used in interrogations. They kicked me in the head and face with their boots, pulled my arms behind my back and tied me up. Then they beat me with a bamboo sword all over my body. My thigh swelled up to double its size. It was purple. I think there was internal bleeding. They were trying to force me to seal the document with my thumb. The document was prepared by them and said that I'd been involved in communist activities. They held my hand to make me do it. That's what they were up to that day. By 1942, the first run of successes had come to an end, and the Battle of Midway was the turning point. Steaming west of Midway, task force of the United States Pacific Fleet speeding to battle with a main enemy force reported bent on invasion. Teamed with carrier-borne aircraft, Army and Marine planes have gone into action, sledgehammering the Japs with high explosive and aerial torpedoes. In three days of fighting, the Japanese fleet was crippled. They lost their four largest aircraft carriers and 250 planes. The Navy tried to hush up the scale of the losses. Even Tojo wasn't told for 10 days. After Midway, Tojo warned that they now faced an enemy that would grow stronger and stronger. The requirements for conscription were changed to get every available man into the army. Thousands of college students who had been allowed to defer army entry were called up. Mutsuo Saito had been studying economics. We all lined up, but we had to wait a long time before Tojo came out. Rain was falling and getting down my neck. I was wet and cold. Tojo said he knew they were all itching to get to the front, and now the waiting was over. Then we all sang Umi Yukaba together. In the stadium, there were students who were staying behind. 
lots of them girls, all waving. Once in the army, new recruits were pitched into the same regime that had conditioned Tojo himself. The Japanese army was the harshest in the world, with its own troops. They saw you from a forge into a strong soldier. By beating. ジポンの軍隊のね。基本方針であ、だから殴るっていうことが日本の軍隊でも日常茶飯事。アブソルートビーデンスを要求されたの。だからそのために、とにかくもう、もし、ちょっぴりでも反抗したら、いや、私はそ
disorganized and how internally conflicted the Japanese government was. Tojo was a very strong leader, but he was not a dictator, and throughout the war, the Japanese are saying 100 million hearts beating is one, and at every level they have conflict, army and navy conflicts, conflicts between different groups within the army and navy, uh, bureaucracy versus the military. And so Tojo is never a dictator. Persuading the emperor that the war would be lost unless he became sole war leader, Tojo became chief of the army general's staff as well as prime minister. Militarization of the entire country was carried a stage further. School children were now sent to work in the arms factories. Tojo said the people of Japan could still win, provided they made the same effort as the soldiers at the front. And what was expected from them was the ultimate sacrifice. No attempt was made to rescue isolated garrisons. In May 1944, the defenders of Attu Island fought on for days until they were entirely wiped out. The telegram from the last surviving officer was read to Mr. Tojo. He was wearing a pair of glasses. He took them off put the telegram on the desk and started to sob loudly. I don't think he was a cold-hearted person, as people say. On the contrary, I think he was full of emotions. Tojo was locking the entire nation into the military's narrow code which sprang from the Bushido and Zen tradition. It was a philosophy of glorious self-destruction, Gyokusai. In July 1944, Japan suffered its greatest defeat yet on Saipan in the Central Pacific. Over 25,000 perished as soldiers fought to the death and civilians committed mass suicide. The war was entering a new phase, air attacks on the Japanese islands themselves. After Saipan, the same senior statesman who had given Tojo the job only weeks before the war began now sacked him. They both blamed him for not running the war properly and were angry he tried to take the powers to do so. He wasn't happy about it, but he accepted it in a very ordinary way. And gracefully, he resigned. Another prime minister was appointed. But unlike in the totalitarian countries or some dictatorships, he was not removed by force. He was not condemned. Nobody condemned him publicly. And it was uh, explained to the public that it was a routine way in Japan that prime ministers come and go. In a last radio broadcast, Tojo said what pained him most was the grave worry the loss had caused the emperor, not the misery which was now bearing down on the whole Japanese people. Put on the retired list, he went back to his house in the Tokyo suburbs. <laughs> 
the war would go on for another year. Even after the air raids intensified and a growing number of Japanese realized they had to sue for peace, Tojo went on advocating a fight to the end. When after the dropping of the bomb, Japan finally surrendered, Tojo would have to decide if he too would die rather than be taken prisoner. In the two weeks between the surrender and the Americans' arrival to occupy Japan, many Japanese generals committed suicide. Tojo made preparations, wrote a last statement, and waited at home. It wasn't until nine days after the occupation began that the orders to arrest Tojo were given by General MacArthur. When the Americans reached his house, Tojo appeared at a window then slammed it shut. And there was a whack from inside the house. And Krauss said, what was that? And Bart said, I think your pigeon just shot himself. He was dressed in a, in a white shirt, uh, whipcord, army pants, high boots. Bloody feathers were lying around. Uh, the bullet had uh, gone through his body and penetrated a feather pillow behind him. Tojo had tried to kill himself, but missed his heart. Doctors worked to revive him. On his desk, they found a suicide note in which he accepted responsibility for the war. In a Yokohama hospital, an American sergeant, John Archinal, is seen giving some of his good blood to save the life of Japan's former premier, General Tojo. Tojo didn't use his samurai swords or his special harakiri knife. He preferred an American 3-2 automatic. He was wearing long silk underwear under these army breeches, and he fought very hard to uh, retain his silk underwear, but the doctors prevailed. They cut off his clothes, and including the underwear, and tossed it aside, and <laughs> it quickly disappeared as GIs uh, picked it up for souvenirs. They nursed Tojo back to health so that he'd be fit enough to stand trial for his life. Once recovered, he was moved to a prison where Allied POWs had been held and mistreated during the war. It was now being used to hold those charged with war crimes. The bot suicide brought him shame and ridicule from his fellow Japanese. Another prisoner was ordered to give him a bath. <laughs> Mr. Tojo said he didn't want to go into the bathtub, so he told us just to rinse him. We scooped water up onto his back, where the gunshot wound from his suicide attempt hadn't healed yet. It was the size of a large coin and was still tender. 
Admiral Shimada told us not to wash that spot so much. However, because I hated Tojo so much, I felt like rubbing it especially hard. <laughs> Tokyo was to have its counterpart to the Nuremberg trials. Tojo would be the principal defendant. And Tojo, having suffered a complete humiliation, believed he had one last duty, to protect the emperor. On the precedent of Nuremberg, the 28 Class A war criminals were charged not just with conventional war crimes, but two crimes new to international law, crimes against humanity and crimes against peace. The International Military Bureau Far East is now in session. A specific purpose, therefore, in these trials is to confirm the already recognized rule that such individuals of a nation who in official positions or otherwise plan aggressive warfare are common felons and deserve and will receive the punishment for ages meted out in every land to murderers, brigands, pirates, and plunderers. The accused were granted American as well as Japanese lawyers. The defense argued the trial couldn't be impartial because the 11 judges all came from the Allied side, with none from neutral countries, and that the charges were too broad. Killing in war couldn't be a crime. The tribunal, please. I request that the defendant, Tojo, take the witness box. Let him take the stand. Tojo himself wasn't called until the end of 1947. <coughs> Mr. President, the defendant Tojo will now be sworn. He had prepared a long statement, which argued that he wasn't a war criminal, but had just been doing his job. Is that your affidavit? Yes. Are the contents therein true and correct? A defense lawyer read the English translation of Tojo's affidavit, his account of events seen through the tunnel vision of the Japanese army. In devastating war that broke out on December 8, 1941, was absolutely provoked by the Allied powers, and it was an unavoidable war of self-defense insofar as my country was concerned. After four days, the prosecutor, Joseph Keenan, who had once taken on Al Capone, could at last cross-examine him. Accused, Togo, Tojo, I shall not address you as general, because of course you know that there is no longer any Japanese army. If this affidavit <coughs> or testimony, or argument, as it may be called, has been intended for the purpose of convincing this court of your innocence, or has been intended to be a continuation of imperialistic, militaristic propaganda to the people of Japan. Uh, you recall you joined the but when you were chosen for that position, it was quite a surprise to you, I take it. Uh, it may be considered that I was surprised in one sense, and yet in another that I was not. <coughs> well, that uh, doesn't enlighten us very much. I would like to have you explain how you could be surprised and not surprised at the same time. Uh, that's a simple matter. If once I was recommended by the three army chiefs as a military man, 
it was up to me to do my best. And therefore, I was neither surprised nor unsurprised. Well, let me give you another I would example. Like, I would like to get a word in edgewise occasionally, Mr. To uh, Tojo. I think we Tojo said the they'd seen the build-up of the American fleet at Pearl Harbor as all part of the threat to Japan and had acted in self-defense. The only way the United States of America could avoid that type of threat would be to take all of its warships out of the Pacific. Isn't that true? Well, that may well be so, but the thing called threat is a subjective thing. Some of the most incriminating evidence came as the prosecution showed Tojo had been fully aware of specific atrocities, what they called conventional war crimes, against prisoners and civilians. But as the trial ground on for nearly two and a half years, criticism of the way it had been mounted grew. One of the greatest examples of Victor's justice is the decision largely by the Americans to leave the emperor out of the trial because he was in fact the commander in chief, he was in fact the man who signed the documents initiating the war. What Tojo was doing in the trial, essentially, was his last act as what they used to refer to as the emperor's shield. Tojo and his fellow defendants went to trial, they said we are guilty of what we're accused of, but they were absolutely united in attempting to exonerate or exclude the emperor from any responsibility. This was their last great act as the emperor's loyal officers. Day off in Tokyo. Alert MPs guard against possible trickery as a bus brings Japan's major war criminals to the International Military Tribunal for sentencing. After the longest trial on record, Hideki Tojo, the little bald-headed warlord who plotted the Pearl Harbor infamy, will hear his fate. After the closing statements in April, the verdicts weren't given till November 1948. Accused Tojo Hideki on the counts of the indictment on which you have been convicted the International Military Tribunal for the Far East sentences you to death by hanging. Six others were also sentenced to death. But unlike Nuremberg, the judgment was not unanimous. The French judge said the emperor should have been indicted. The Indian, Justice Powell, said aggressive war was not a crime under international law. The sentences were carried out 50 years ago, two days before Christmas 1948. I was apprehensive about it. The uh, theater executioner and his assistant, who was an officer there at the prison, they, they says, now you come on, come on, Jim, it'll be all right. What our duties were is when the prisoner was brought in and turned around on the trap. We pulled the uh, black hood over their head and then we took the noose and we put it over and <clears throat> snubbed it up against behind the ear and then stepped back. And there was a lever here that controlled the trap door and stepped back and upon the command of the uh, of the theater executioner, we went forward with our lever and dropping the prisoner. The Americans took the bodies to a crematorium in Yokohama. Afterwards, they asked for the ashes to be handed over and scattered them so they could never be worshipped or revered but in that they failed. Today, in a small village in northern Japan, a Buddhist priest and his wife look after the remains of Tojo and the six other executed men. The ashes were acquired by Mr. Majima's father, who put up the memorial secretly in the 1950s. <laughs> 
There are two other larger shrines in Japan where they pray for the war criminals daily. Back in 1948, the Yokohama crematorium manager shortchanged the Americans over Tojo's ashes. He gave the Americans only part of the cremated remains and hid the rest till the occupation was over. Maijimas keep some of the surplus war criminal ashes and other cherished relics of the seven in a storehouse in their garden. First, here are the ashes of the seven who were executed. And then here we have some earth from where they were hung. And here's some of their hair. All sorts of things which my father-in-law would call part of our national history are kept here for future generations. The idea that Tojo was a martyr, brought to a new generation through the film Pride, is angrily disputed by Japan's neighbors and by many Japanese themselves who believe their war was aggressive. The question of whether Tojo was really Asia's Hitler or just the man required to shoulder the principal blame makes little difference to the victims. But the flaws of the trial have allowed Tojo, with his contorted sense of loyalty and honor, to remain an ambiguous and haunting figure.